Lord. We want to welcome everybody to this teaching. The title is called, Is God in Control? A couple of days ago, the Lord really put this on my heart and on Gina's heart to give this teaching. And quite honestly, the last couple of days, we, we hear different pastors and evangelists that we really honor and admire and look up to talking about this topic. As we're all aware, in light of the events that have taken place in Texas, we send our love and our prayers yes. to everybody. Heavenly Father, Gene and I praise you, we give you thanks, and we ask you, let this message bring peace and comfort. Touch each heart and each life that is watching this today. May it bring comfort and transformation in the name of Jesus. Let these be your words. Let us say only what you want us to say and not say what you do not want us to say. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So I was just talking to a friend yesterday and I was talking to him about you know, what he thought about that as God in control. And this is going to be, I really feel this is the Lord. I know this is the Lord. And let's just open, let's everybody open our hearts and be receptive to this. <clears throat> this is a quote from Dan Moeller, somebody that Gene and I really honor and respect. And this is his quote. You always hear the statement that God is in control. Well, if God is in control, then why was there a law of sin and death? Why do people reap what they sow? Why is death and life in the power of the tongue? Why did God give us a sword and a shield? Why are men destroyed by a lack of knowledge? That's a lot to take in right there. It is. We're just going to get started with this. We're going to dig in deep with it. And to really, to start, let's go to the beginning. And let's start with Genesis chapter 1, starting at verse 26. And what we really want to do is what a man, evangelist Tiff Shuttlesworth, he always says he starts in the Bible stay in the Bible, and finish in the Bible. Gina and I love and respect him, and we really want to do this for this teaching and make sure that we start, stay, and finish in what the Bible is saying. What is God saying on this topic? Chapter 1 of Genesis, starting at verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Verse 28. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on earth. This commentary I looked at earlier, it's so important to read this to you. God originally created people in his image. What is meant by God's image? It includes spiritual, moral, and intellectual properties. Being the only creatures made in God's image, people had a unique opportunity to relate to God personally. Thus, they are not merely imitators of God's nature, but they actually participate in it. Adam and Eve's sin marred the image and brought about separation from God, further distorting their likeness to God. That is huge. That is so important to understand that. Mm -hmm. 
This is going to be some reading here, but really hear me out and take this in. And this message, honestly, is something that I highly recommend that you replay it a couple times because it's a lot to take in at one time. Yes. I would highlight the verses, the scriptures that we're giving you. I would study them out. I would take notes. And I would pray about this. There is the perfect will of God, and there is the permissive will of God. He gives you free will. We are a free moral agent. We can choose between good and evil, and we can choose captivity and death. People ask, why did God allow this? If he allows it, then he is still responsible for it. The enemy, Satan, is like a snake in the grass that bites a person and slithers away and watches God get the blame. Satan knows that he can't dethrone God, but he believes that he can get every person to put God on the stand where we become the prosecutor and the jury, and God is the defendant on trial. The devil knows how much God loves us, but the devil believes that we don't really love God, we only need God for what he can do for us. In every attempt of the devil to break you, he runs the risk of making you. That's a famous Dan quote right there. In every attempt of the devil to break you, he runs the risk of making you. And I read to you Genesis 126 to 28, when God gave us dominion, that means to rule over and subdue it. That was God's original plan and original design for man. When Adam and Eve sinned, there was a perversion that took place. There was a twisting in that fall. So all these things that we see going on around this is a byproduct of the fall and before adam fell i just heard a wonderful teaching we need to keep in mind that satan fell satan is a fallen angel lucifer satan the devil he's the same being he was an angel that was so prideful he wanted to exalt himself above god and he fell from heaven he is a demon he hates people. He hates God's children. Like I read, he knows that he cannot dethrone God. But in his pride and his hatred for God's creation, he does believe that if he can do enough evil, he will have all of us questioning the goodness of God. Amen. Because I wasn't in my notes there, but he wants you. That is his goal. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy and we'll get to that yes. and jesus said i've come to give you life and life abundantly but the devil's goal he wants you to question god like i mm -hmm. said earlier that was i know that was holy spirit that gave it to me dan moeller taught on it before but then it kind of i opened it up a little more with it and expounded upon it we end up becoming the prosecutor and the jury and God's a defendant, and he has to defend himself to his, we are the creation. And the creation is prosecuting the creator. That's called the fall of man. Woo! Go for it, babe. <laughs> I gave you a nice intro. You better bring it. Okay. <laughs> We're going to James chapter 1, starting at verse 13. And, and I hope this is really making sense to people. And like I said, you're going to have to play well, this again. I think that, you know, um, I, in everything that you said, that what kept coming into my mind is the scripture that talks about that we, we battle not against flesh and blood. Amen. Okay. Ephesians it's a spiritual six. battle. But yeah. the thing is that people who do not read the word, people who do not, um, people who don't know yet, because I once didn't know, even though I was Catholic and went to church, I didn't know. I hadn't read the Bible. So I did not realize that it is daily a spiritual battle. 
because the enemy, Satan, Lucifer, whatever you want to call him, works through people. He yes. doesn't usually come at you. It is not typical for Satan to just show up in a big red cape and come after you with a pitchfork. That's not how this works. But unfortunately, that's the picture that has been painted to the world. I'm glad you're addressing know. this. Amen. So they think unless this black puff of smoke shows up in their room with this uh, evil um, beast in the middle of their room, that Satan isn't in, you know, having any power in their life. But the fact is that Satan uses demons that work through people. Say that again. Okay, so perfect. What did I say? Satan <laughs> Satan uses demons that work through people. Amen. People who Correct. have opened doors to him and they don't even most of them do not even know it. Some do because some purposely and intentionally invite him good, in. Good work. And good they work. want to do evil, but there are others that don't even realize yeah. it. They are so bound in their addictions, in their um, sufferings, in their hatred, in their bigotry, in their unforgiveness and their grudges and all these other things that they have, their perversions, that they don't even realize they are oblivious to the fact that Satan is using them as a host. He's using them, and they he sends them out to affect other people. I mean, have you ever been in a store, and you're just minding your own business walking through, and somebody just, I mean, they come at you, they are just letting you have it, or you're at the gas station or the bank, and somebody just, just like, you can tell they have locked eyes we on you. We had it happen last week. Two, right. Two different people, and yeah. you could just look at them and know... That they are demon possessed. Right. They just verbally attack you. They get super angry with you for you're not even doing anything. They demons are working through people. Okay. And they work through people that you know, people in your community, your workplace, people that you don't know. So I think mm -hmm. that's important to know because that's what was just It is, absolutely. Out. That was so important to share that. And um, I've said this before. Demons drive Holy Spirit leads. Right. I would put that in your notes. Yes. Demons drive the Holy Spirit leads. Yes. We talked about this earlier today. When people, when they have porn addiction, when they're making porn, when they have drug addiction, alcoholism, cheating on their spouse, they're being driven by a spirit. They are. That's what we're trying to get through to people. I was so glad you mentioned right. Ephesians chapter 6. That yeah. wasn't in the notes, but it tells you that we wrestle right. not against flesh and blood. I think a lot of people, like I said, a lot of people don't know, and I know I used to not know. Right, and we've used so, the last teaching. You know, you know, my people are destroyed by a lack of knowledge. That's why right. he says that in Hosea chapter 4. Don't you hear a lot of people right now with all the things that are happening in the world and they'll say it's like the world has just gone crazy people <laughs> are nuts yes but see what they don't know is that it is a spiritual battle amen it really is it is so okay so i am in the book of james chapter one starting at verse 13. let no one say when he is tempted i am tempted by god for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Amen, sweetie. Todd White has a wonderful quote that this will go right to your spirit and you'll anybody can remember this. It's John 10.10. 10. The thief, which is Satan, comes only to steal 
kill, and destroy. But Jesus says, I have come to give you life and life abundantly. If it is steal, kill, and destroy, it is from the devil. And if it is life and life abundantly, it is from our Heavenly Father. That's right. You can't get any clearer or plainer than that. That was Matthew 10.10. 10. Are you ready for Ezekiel 33.11? I am. I am absolutely ready. And be, okay. Yeah go, yeah, go for it. Are you ready for me? I'm ready for you. All right. Ezekiel 33.11. <laughs> Say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his ways and live. Turn from your evil ways. Right. That tells you the heart of the Father right Absolutely. there. And that's in the Old Testament. It is always God's will for every person to come to him. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He so loved the world. It doesn't say for God only loved certain people. You know, for God so loved the world, That's everybody. every person on this earth that has ever existed, God so loved them, it is his great desire for them to return to him and be restored to him through the blood of Jesus Christ. And it is our free will whether we choose to receive that or not. Amen. I wrote this, that was my post today, this morning on Facebook. I believe it's a Tiff Shuttlesworth. It might be a Rodney Howard Brown. It might be Pastor Tony Carpenter. It might be Jonathan Shuttlesworth. Everybody is somebody to God. Yeah. Put that in your notes. Everybody is somebody to God. So when you're going out throughout your day, when you're checking out at the grocery store and the person is checking you out, they mean a lot to Jesus. Jesus paid a high price. He paid the ransom right. for everybody. He loves people. He does. This is a wonderful segue because in 2 Peter chapter 3, Verse 9, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slow, slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. See, so when we talk about control, and when I read the beginning things from Dan, if God was in control, he's wishing that all would come to repentance. He desires that all would be saved. He takes no delight in the death of the wicked. But people, not everybody, not everyone is saved. And not everybody is going to be saved. So that's when I said that earlier. I think I learned that from Pastor Jonathan Shuttlesworth. The importance of knowing the difference of the perfect will of God and the permissive will of God. Right. If I want to... After this teaching, I could walk out the door, I could get in the car, I could go to the bar, I could get drunk, I could hook up with some lady at the bar, I could sleep with her. The Lord will let me do that. Sure. But that's not his perfect will. He's given us free will. We've given teachings on that. He doesn't create robots and he's putting all his trust that he he believes he loves people so much that he's putting all his chips in he gave his son that people are going to turn their back on sin and turn their heart to christ and i'm telling you the day to do this is now and i meant to say this in the beginning if there is any teaching that i would ask each one that watches this pastors if you're our friends, family, it's really important, I ask you, to get this teaching out. I'm going to just send the challenge out. And it is putting some pressure on you because it's a serious topic and it may be things 
that maybe you don't really like to address with some people and maybe you don't want to be affiliated with somebody talking the way that Gina and I are talking. But I'm asking, please share this with all of your friends and family. Send it out to friends. Send it out to your children. Post it on Facebook. We put so many things on Facebook. I had a post the other day. It comes up on Facebook. Anyone that has it, it says, what's on your mind? And I wrote something. What about if it said, what's on God's mind? You are. That's right. This teaching needs to get out because so many are blaming God. Definitely. And they have so many questions of why, why does God allow it? Yeah. Why does God cause it? If he's so good, why, why does somebody go into a building and kill innocent children? Why, why, yeah. why? People need to talk about that well, and have so the important. proper way to answer it right. from what the Bible is saying. I don't want to see, we don't want to see anyone walk away from the Lord or become angry and bitter toward the Lord because of events that have taken right. place yes. that people have have caused. And unfortunately, that happens a lot. And when something happens, all of a sudden there's a tragedy or a loss or a terrible situation occurs and everybody gets angry with God and it becomes, well, where was God? What was, God obviously didn't care about right. this. So I think that our most sincere desire in this situation is to maybe help facilitate some conversations about this, get people in the word and help people to realize the truth of the situation and not blame God and not put him on trial right. for what people are choosing with their free will to do. I'm, I'm, I'm begging you. If you love us and you trust us, post this on your Facebook. You may not agree with everything that we're talking about theologically, but if you truly are a Christian, you have to agree with what we're t most of the stuff that we're speaking about. I mean, He's this so this is such fire. He has two and I, and I was going to say right that now. this message is so fire that I have a Bible on each hand. I mean, I looked over and I see a Bible on each leg. I'm like, man, this is yeah. I mean, I love okay. Jonathan Shuttlesworth. I don't even know if I've seen him holding two Bibles in his hand at one time. But, I mean, he, he's good enough. He could do it with one. If for me, it takes two of them. He could do it with one. <laughs> God bless you, Jonathan, and a dollar Shuttlesworth. We love you. If you ever see this message, you have poured into her life more than you'll probably ever know. But if you ever hear the message, then you will know. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. That's again God crying out to his people. Oh, how I wish that you would choose life. I want you to choose life. But I love you so much that I'm going to give you a choice. Now this one, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, and then I want you to tell the, you great, you gave an amazing analogy this morning okay. at, uh, at breakfast time. This is what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. This is when people might get their panties in a bunch here, and this might be the thing that stops them from posting it. And I'm and if, if you're somebody that doesn't post because of this verse, that this is God speaking to people, I would I recommend that she get alone with them and talk to them. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. 
Verse 11, this is so important to get. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. This is what Gina and I try to teach people and preach to them. We know that our main calling is, is teaching and preaching on transformation by from getting in the Word of God and spending time alone with our Heavenly Father. Because we know where we were, and we know where we are now. So it's yeah. like, we've heard yeah. a quote, a man with an experience is never at the mercy of a, a man with an argument. Right. And that applies for a woman as well. When you experience right. the goodness of God and His Word, and it's alive and active, and it completely does a transformation in your life, when people bring up your past, you can actually say to them, I don't even know who you're talking about because that old man is dead. That woman is dead. That's the classic Second okay. Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. Old things have passed away. Yeah. Behold, all things have become new. And I just got to read two things on the newness of that, and I'm turning it over to my beautiful wife. Now I just got to find it. Christians are brand new people on the inside. The Holy Spirit gives them new life, and they are not the same anymore. We are not reformed, rehabilitated, or re-educated. We are recreated. New creations, mm -hmm. living in vital union with Christ. At conversion, we do not merely turn over a new leaf. We begin a new life under a new master. You have to replay this again. At conversion, we do not merely turn over a new leaf. We begin a new life under a new master. And evangelist Tiff Shuttlesworth, I love his analogy with this, he, he compares it to a vehicle. When a car gets into a wreck and it's all dented up, you can take your car to the, to the body shop and they could put on a new bumper, they could bang out the dents. Someone that's watching this is going to relate exactly to this. You could repaint it, but no matter what you do to that vehicle, if somebody looks that up on paper, it will say, if it's done legally, it will say legally, this vehicle was in an accident. Okay. And if you took the paint off and you start doing everything, you would see, oh, wow, there's dents and cracks. And that's a new bumper put on there, but there's, there's damage. We are brand new. That's not how it is with Christ in us. We become a brand new creation. Okay. So it's not like they just fix your car they gave you a brand new car. It's right. brand new, one that never existed before. Here, take the speed up car, dent it up. We're giving you a brand new one today. We heard our pastor, Pastor David Whittington. We love him. We, we appreciate Pastor David and Pastor Tracy. They are amazing pastors. They are laid down lovers of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And we watched one of his teachings and he was talking about you know, we hear the common thing about, be, you know, be not conformed to the world, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And he was comparing it to, we hear this often, a caterpillar and a butterfly. But the way he explained it, it just, I never heard it explained that way where it just pierced my heart that a caterpillar goes around and it eats the plants, it eats things and it causes destruction. It's a devourer. It devours. It does. But then it goes into its cocoon. Now, there's the debate. Some scientists, you can look this up if you're a science person and you want to check it out. There are scientists that believe. I didn't know this, but you Google it. Look it up. Read about it. Do your own research. They believe that the caterpillar, when it goes into its cocoon and goes through a process, it dies in the cocoon. And then it becomes a butterfly. 
Then as a butterfly, when it goes around now and it goes on the flowers and plants, it pollinates. It creates life. Where before as a caterpillar, it was a devourer right. and a destroyer of life. Now you are a butterfly that you're a giver of life. You're a creator of life. That's right. That's so powerful to me. Absolutely. It, it's, Absolutely. it's amazing. Yes. Because people really need to get the brand new creation part. Right. And the only way you get it is you have to believe it. It's like anything else. It's by the grace of God. Right. We're saved by grace through faith. And you get the revelation, and then just you build upon that, and it grows deeper and deeper. Just that, right. just like hearing that message from Pastor David and the way he explained well, it. Well, I'm thinking about that, and then I'm thinking, like, have you ever seen, because you never will, have you ever <laughs> seen a half caterpillar, half butterfly? It's like stuck. It's it's half, it's still half <laughs> a caterpillar good. and half a butterfly, uh -huh. and it's got wings, but it can't yeah. fly, and it's chewing leaves. That doesn't right. exist. It doesn't happen. And that should not happen as a born-again believer. The old man should be dead. Man or woman should be dead. And the new man or woman is alive in mm -hmm. Christ. And it's it's brand new. Yeah. You're brand new. Your your life is brand new. Your brand new. ways are brand new. Your attitude, your reactions, your behavior, your choices, brand new, lining up with the Word of God. When we pray, people call it the Lord's Prayer. It's actually the model prayer. The Lord's Prayer is in John 17 when, he, when he's praying to the Father. But the model prayer, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. As Christians, we're supposed to be bringing heaven to earth. We are. And when you see destruction... That is from the domain of Satan. That is, is never from our Heavenly Father. It is not. Okay. And there's the so, notes there. You can yeah, go for okay. it. You had a great analogy with well, that. Well, people, I, through the, through the um, discussions we have been listening to over the last few days about this situation uh, that occurred in Texas and that it has occurred in many other places. You know, people have been gradually, since really the 60s, I think it might have been 1965 if I'm right, when they took prayer out of school, um, but they have been gradually trying to remove themselves from God, the general public in this country, and, and move further and further away. They don't want you to teach their children about Jesus. They don't want you to preach the gospel. They don't want Bibles. They don't want Christian material in the schools. They don't want prayer in the schools. They don't want it in the workplace and so on and so forth. So people have wanted to remove themselves and there are even some churches, some mm -hmm. churches where- Not where we go. No, not where we go, Praise but there God. are some churches where really they've taken Jesus out of there. I mean, I, I don't know what they're doing, but really it is not, um, it's not going there to preach the gospel. Let's say that. So as the, as society has moved further and further and further away from God, from prayer, from going to church, from teaching their children the values of that are in the Bible. Mm -hmm. They don't want the word of God. They call anybody that believes the word of God a bigot and all these other hateful. things. Hateful. Uh, intolerant. You, you name, name it. it. Okay, there's been a host of things that, okay. But they want the world to go further and further and further into the things that they think are right, which we all know are not, okay. So when these things happen in a situation, then everybody says, the first thing they say is, well, where was God? Why didn't God do anything about this? Well, you have told God you want nothing to do with him. You don't read his word. You don't talk to him. You don't pray. You don't go to church. You don't want anything to do with the Lord. But when something goes wrong, you immediately want to blame God and put him on trial. 
And I was words. thinking about it, and I said, you know, Chopper, I said, our relationship with God is a covenant. It is a blood covenant by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. It is a covenant. So on a smaller scale, let's pare it down. Let's just think about this for a minute. It's something to think about, okay? Chopper and I are married, and we are in a covenant. We are in a covenant with each other and with the Lord. Now, if one day I say to him, you know what? I'm done with this marriage. I don't want anything more to do with you. I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to see you. I don't want to spend time with you. I want you out of this house. I want you out of my life for good. I want nothing to do with you. And he leaves. And I say, you know what? I, I think I'm going to bring in this new guy. I know he's a rapist and I know he's a murderer, but I really, I think that we, we have something going here. I'm bringing him in and I want you out. And then something terrible happens to me with this other man. He does something horrible to me. And then I turn around and say to him, well, where were you? Why didn't you do anything to help me? You didn't do anything to stop this. You were not there. You did nothing on my behalf. Well, I told him to get out. I told him I want nothing more to do with you. I want you out of my life. I don't want anything, no more covenant with you. But then the minute something happens to me, I'm mad at him and I'm saying, why aren't you doing something to stop this? I want people just to think about what we are doing right. when we push God and, and everything that's in his word out of our life and we call it bigotry and mm -hmm. we call it intolerance and we call it hate. Which is the opposite of what it is because it's love. They God want to teach your, they want to teach kindergarten age schools all about sex. Right. And whatever you Three feel and like four you years are, old. you can be. If you feel like a, a girl, you can be a girl. If you're a girl right. and you feel like a boy, you can be a boy. Teachers right. are in there to teach. Teach science. Right. Teach history. They're not in teach there to math. teach about those things. At that, at that age, what is a, a four or five year old even going to do with this They don't this even understand any of that. So the point being, when you push God out of everything in your life and you are rebellious and you choose to do everything against what God's word says and you use your free will to invite all these things into your life, when something goes wrong... Don't let the first words out of your mouth be, well, why did God allow this? Why didn't God do anything about this? Look, I heard someone say this recently. When you close the door on God, you open the door to the devil. And yeah. we want to make sure, like hear us correctly, what Gina is saying is not that because God, this isn't God doing it, saying, oh, well, you didn't want me, now no. I'm going to smite your no, children. No, 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 no. That's not no. the heart of the Father. No, That's why we're reading not. all these verses, the not. goodness of God and the love of the Father. The love of the Father. Absolutely. But when you close the door on him and you open up the door to all these other agendas and you open up the door to the right. devil, this is a byproduct of it. Remember, it is a spiritual battle. People have free will. So when a person uses their free will to attack other people and bring destruction upon other people, please do not blame God for what a person has chosen to do. Right. Everybody wants rights and freedoms and privileges and everybody wants the right to do whatever they want to do. So if I said to you, would you like to have free will? You'd say, yes, I do. But then when someone uses their free will to do something terrible and maybe something that hurts you, that's what that person chose to do, not what God is doing to you. Amen. God loves you. It is never his will. Never his will. Steal, kill, destroy hurt, is ever. from the Satan and people that are demonically possessed demoniacs they were you know people don't think they exist anymore oh, they but exist. i think more and more people are even people that don't believe like gina said earlier you can just see when people are cutting people off and they have no right. patience and they're yelling at people in the grocery right. store they're being driven by they demons are. they are 
This is a evangelist Jonathan Shuttlesworth quote. Now he's a pastor. And God bless you, Jonathan and Adalis. I mean, the Lord is just blessing their life because of their obedience. He, there's a blessing of the yes in their life. You just cannot deny what's going on with their ministry. Amen. The devil is a punk. He looks for easy targets. And I have in my notes to mention how Jonathan set up his church from day one. As soon as he, he said, as soon as he set his church up, he was more interested and concerned about setting it up with proper security before setting up the, a nice camera, microphone, or a stage or a pulpit or, or something to stand on to preach. Any school and any church that after, I think, it was 1999 when I think that was Columbine, honey, when I looked it up. I think that was roughly right. 1999. Right. It's 23 years ago. And it, it keeps happening. When you, every time this happens, we have to be, <clears throat> we have to stop saying, how did this happen? There has to be proper security. Yes. <clears throat> Put a police officer right. at the front of every school building. Keep every door locked, please. Do not have other ways that people can enter in. Can something bad still happen? Because someone wants to you know, say that, oh, well, something still could happen. Well, yes, it, can. it can. But you limit the chances of it. And like he said, the yeah. devil is a punk. He doesn't really like confrontation. So in a church, what Jonathan did before you even get into his building, he has professional, trained, secure, armed security guards in the front before you get to the building. Then he has more when you get into the building. Then he has more where he's preaching at. He has security guards on each side of him. And they're all facing towards the door. Because Jonathan, the man's... For, I think 41, he's so brilliant. He's such a smart guy. This is like common sense Christianity. Someone wrote him, oh, we're at our church. We got a couple guys that have concealed carry. He corrected the person. He said, that's not security. That's going to be too late. We're going to have a shootout at the OK Corral. You have professionally trained people that are constantly watching and monitoring what is going on at all times? Right. And here's the other thing. Because I said this. Mention Pete. This is in the notes. Mention people want to blame guns. The problem is evil. It is. Until evil is removed and a spirit of murder or a spirit of hate is removed from that person. People, this is facts. You want some facts, right? We all like facts and proof. A person that is filled with demons will bomb a place, burn down a place, stab a crowd of people, use a box cutter, use a vehicle to drive into a crowd of people, use a hammer, or even use an axe. And the things that I wrote down, I wrote them down intentionally because there have been people that have used that. Yes. And please just don't make the debate, oh, because it's a, a magazine and they could do more damage. When somebody, how much damage can somebody do when they make a bomb and they bomb a whole building right. or burn an entire building down? When somebody is possessed and they have a spirit of murder in them, they will do whatever they have to do they to will. carry it out, and then they usually end up killing themselves. Here's some things that Holy Spirit was giving me. And these, these are quotes. If you like them, write them down. If you don't, then you don't need to write them down. You think you can love the hell out of people. Be careful you are not loving them into hell. You think you can love the hell out of people. Be careful you are not loving them in to hell. As Christians, we love people. 
Me too. But more and more what I'm learning from Rodney Howard Brown and Tiff Shuttlesworth and Jonathan and Pastor Tony Carpenter and Pastor Karen Carpenter, you, you love good and you have to hate evil. Yeah. Tiff always says you will never get rid of a sin that you don't have a hate for. True. It's just the plain old truth with it. And there's a time to address people. Never allow your children to make the rules with you. Children are called to honor their mother and their father. We're living in a society now that it's like the norm that the child tells the parent what to do. And if you're not going to do it, do it my way, then things aren't going to go well for you. You don't ever give in like that. There's a difference of loving somebody. You can love a person, but... Do not condone any of the action. I have things with, with, with family members that I absolutely do not condone. It's known that I do not condone it and I won't play games with it at all. Because I know in the end that sin will destroy the person. So I love people, but I hate sin. My sister and I talked like on the last teaching and she said she liked that I mentioned that it's a, that I'm aggressive and it's good to see that in myself. I'm very aggressive when it comes to sin because I know that the devil hates God's children. He hates them. He hates me and I hate him. So I'm aggressive to sin. I'm aggressive to anything that is going to destroy somebody's life. I won't condone it. I won't play games with it. Let's call a spade a spade. You got to be real with things. The Bible says the kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent take it by force. You know, Marcus Rogers, we love him because he's, you know, he says gummy bear Christianity. People just think that, why is it always that the attack is always on Christians? They don't, you know, if, if anyone says anything about a Muslim or a mosque or a Hindu or anybody else, it's just a church. And then the church is just supposed to be quiet about it. Yeah. And they know they could do that. And that's why it, it continues to happen. Get some aggress aggression in you. Some people are too passive with your Christian walk. You will never get rid of a sin that you don't hate. Get rid of sin before sin gets rid of you. That's evangelist Tiff Shuttlesworth, the man that's been in ministry for, I think, almost 50 years. I would say he knows what he's talking about. I would say so. Another note. G Judas was with Jesus for three and a half years, and Judas still betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. Have you ever thought about that? He was one of the 12 disciples. He spent three and a half years with King Jesus. He watched him do miracles. He watched them heal people. He watched them feed, feed people. He watched them love people. He saw the compassion in them. And he was with Jesus, the Son of God. And he sold him out for 30 pieces of silver. Think about that. Go ahead, sweetie. I know you got some more scripture. Start in the Bible, stay in the Bible, okay. and we're going to finish in the Bible. Okay. I'm in 1 Timothy chapter 2, starting at verse 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. Amen. So it is God's desire for every person to be saved. It is God's desire to see every person. And, it, and that goes beyond what, like, even our heart and mind sometimes are willing to receive because... You know, sometimes people go, you know, their sin is so great mm -hmm. in our eyes that it's like... Right, how could that be forgiven? You're, you're going to forgive this guy that, you know, murdered five people, or you're going to mm -hmm. forgive this man that was a pedophile, or you're going to forgive this woman that, you know, whatever, she, I, I don't know, whatever she did, killed her children. 
sometimes the the sins are like on our scale in our heart and mind are so big we're like i don't think so Mm -hmm. but that's not god right that's not god god still sees the person he created inside of that person that is rotting away from sin yes and he still desires to see them be saved he still loves them He still is sending people in their path to try to reach them. He is still presenting himself over and over again, saying, here I am, son, here I am, Mm -hmm. daughter. And he still forgives, and he still loves, and he Mm -hmm. still restores, and they still have salvation if they come to him. Yes. So there is no one that has ever done too much or gone too far in God's eyes. That Jesus, the price Jesus paid wasn't enough for their salvation. It was enough for every one of them. So that's that's the good news. And the Lord keeps putting this on my heart. That is the Remember, good news. Jesus wept. When these events take place, it breaks the heart of the Father. It He's does. crying for the families. Oh my goodness. It's unimaginable. It is unimaginable. That's what the Bible says, to rejoice with those that rejoice and weep with those that weep. All you can do is weep about a situation like this. There's nothing that's going to bring somebody comfort in the situation. But what we're trying to do is let people understand the heart of the Father and who is behind evil. How did evil enter in and how do you get rid of it? It breaks the heart of Jesus. Where was Jesus in in all of that? He was right there with everybody, and it breaks his heart. Absolutely. Gina always had this wonderful quote. I'm going to let you read it. I don't want to steal that one because that's yours. It's right on top for you, honey. When people ask you. Oh, yeah. God, why don't you do something? And he said, I already did. I created you. That's the thing is a lot of times, you know, that goes back to what Papa Doug taught us way back when we were first at Harvest. Mm -hmm. And he said, are you part of the solution or are you part of the problem? And that was going to be the ending of the the teaching. That was going to be be part of the solution and not the problem. Sorry. Doug Johnson, never be sorry for well, that because it could be said is, and we'll say it again. That is. Because and, and, let a person ask himself this, anybody right, watching, right. am I part of the solution right. or am I part of the right. problem? So here's the thing. Even if you're doing nothing and you're just talking about how awful a situation is, then you really kind of are still part of the problem because you're not doing right. anything. Right. What are you, you doing know, about there it? There is something you can do, whether you are interceding in prayer and covering people in prayer. Are you sending money to help a family? Are you going there personally to do some type of mission work? Whatever it is, anything that is going on in this life, there is something God has put inside of you that is unique. It is special. It belongs to you, and it's a gift to you from him. And it goes with your divine purpose and calling. And so you are the answer to somebody's somebody's prayer. Amen. Good word. Each one of us. And, and we're all meant to do something different, and we're all going to do it in a very unique and different way. But each one of us can be the answer to someone's prayer. Mm -hmm. Each one of us can be the solution to someone's problem. Good word. If we position ourselves to be. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I wanted to add, Jesus forgave and he said, go and sin no more. Like people are good on the forgiveness part, but you have to understand when when he forgave people, He would add something to that. You are forgiven, but go and sin no more. That's right. Because if you go and sin again after that, you're opening up the doors again for the enemy to come back in to steal, kill, and destroy. That's right. 
Uh, I just heard this today and I had to put this in the notes. I, I think it was Evangelist Tiff. It was either Tiff or Jonathan. Your father is either God or your father is Satan. You can't have both. And then a Dan Moeller quote, he would always joke and say, this isn't Burger King, have it your way. And I googled it. Do you know what their new slogan is now? And this isn't by accident. Be your way. Be your way. You know, you just do you and I'll do me. And it's okay. God understands. Don't judge me. And I had to add this because I've heard uh, Frank Turek talk about this, a brilliant theologian. This guy's so amazing. He, he goes into college campuses and he stands up on a platform and these college students that are just beginning to learn, they debate him about God. And there's a grace on his life because he is so patient and kind and loving, but he's aggressive. But he'll allow them to just ask these crazy off the wall questions and try to get them twisted. And he just stands there and asks. And I love this went right to my spirit when people ask them a question and they're saying, so you're saying this? You're saying God's not okay with someone being a gay person? You're saying God's not okay if I do this? You're saying it's not okay if, if I get drunk? And he says, no, I'm not saying that. That's what the Bible's saying. So as Christians, we're saying what the Bible is saying. It's in there for a reason. It's in there for our protection. God puts it up. You know, we talk about things like that. You know, we, we go out driving and there's guardrails up. Not to ruin the fun of your driving experience. It's right. to protect you. We put fences up around our yard when we have little ones and we have a fence around there not to ruin the child's fun. It's to keep them safe. That's right. So they don't run out in the street and get injured. So there's a protection around them. Amen. Amen. Yep. Be part of the solution and not part of the problem. And... Let's read Revelation. Okay, I'm going to read. And I got that, and we're going to wrap it Revelation up. Revelation 319. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand Behold. at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. So that goes back to what we were saying. Jesus is always standing there at the door of every yes. heart of every person. He's doing it right knocking. now for each person. For every person. He is knocking at the door of your heart. He loves you. He wants you to be free. He wants you to have eternal life. He wants you to be free of the bondage of the sin that you're right. in. Will you let him in and do it his way and not right. your way? He will wash you clean. He will set you free. See, people, I was talking to my friend about that. It's like, you know, people want heaven on earth. That's not going to happen yet. While Satan is still roaming around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour... There will always be this going on. But you never want to end a teaching without having a solution and ending it on the greatest news ever and on a high note. That's right. Revelation chapter 21, verse 4, it's talking about Jesus. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Every wrong as a Christian, when you understand this, when a person gets a hold of it, God is a God of justice. He's a God of mercy. God is love. God is holy. He is righteous, and he is a God of justice. And every wrong will be made right. It says he will create Amen a new heaven, and a new earth. And when that happens, there will not be people walking in 
to schools shooting little kids. There will not be pedophiles. That's right. There will not be husbands beating their wives up. All that will be wiped away. But right now, we're here on earth. And as Christians, we're called to bring heaven down to earth. Using it again, being part of the solution and not the problem. I learned this from Jonathan last year. Some people get so busy about, and they want to complain about what the president is doing and the government. This will, this will really help people. I mean, this helped me. Stay in your Metron. I have no control over who is in office right now other than just playing my part and putting a vote in. Right. And then after that happens, we're called to pray for our president. So whoever it is, you pray for your leaders. Like it or not, that's, that's what that's right. God's word says. But if you just stay in your metron of who you can influence, who's around you, friends, family, loved ones, and then, you know, the, when God gives you and you're faithful with, with small things, you get bigger things. That's, that's how right. the kingdom works. And to whom much is given, much is required. So the more that you have for somebody that's a pastor over a 50,000 member church, he's got a lot that he's responsible for. Each person has to give an account to the Lord. So sometimes it might be better. I know it says, right, yeah, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge, but then the more knowledge you're getting, and then you do know better, and then you do it, that, that should be like a holy reverence and a holy fear about right. that. Now, I wanted to end this teaching before we give people an opportunity for a prayer of salvation because now is the day of salvation. Yes. We know that we're just here for a vapor and a mist and life is not guaranteed. We don't know what is happening from the next moment. Next time that you hear the statement or asked, is God in control? We hope this helps you answer the question properly and confidently. Now don't miss this important key. God is in control when it comes to Bible prophecy. What God said will happen will surely come to pass. Yes, it will. As evangelist Tiff Shuttlesworth always says, the next major event to take place is the rapture of the church. Nobody and no prayers or no demon in hell will stop the rapture. The church prays to God for more time, so more souls will come into the kingdom. The rapture is not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. The question is, are you living ready to meet the Lord? This is a question that each person has to ask themselves. Are you living ready to meet the Lord now. Not I'm getting ready to meet him. Not I'm working on getting rid of my sin. Not I'm working on this and I'm working towards that. We're talking about right now. This is by far the, the, the most important teaching that we have given. It's, it's from the Lord. It's the heart of the Father. And you have to understand that he loves you dearly. We've given you so many scripture, the goodness of God, how much he loves his children, how we're created in his image. But he gives us all a choice. Do you want to do it his way or do you want to have it your way? So if this message has touched your heart, I, I urge each and every person if you are not a Christian yet, if you never heard a message like this, and so now you want to become born again, or if you were, and then something happened, and you walked away from the Lord, and you really just want to say a prayer, or if you're really not sure, if you ever really just said you're, you're fully in, and given a full surrender. Some people just say, I'm really not sure if... If Jesus returned right now, 
I, I don't really know if I would be ready. I mean, I, I, I think I might be, or I mean, I know God understands my heart and everything. You don't get in by your good works. There's only one way in. There's only one way to the Father, and his name is Jesus. He's the way to the Father. No other way. You can't do enough good deeds. You can't earn it. You can't deserve it. You can't pay for it. It's not a weighing scale, picture of scale. People that just can visualize things as a scale. And then you pass away and then, he, well, which one was it? Did I do a little more good? Right. Did the good make outweigh. it? Did, did the bad outweigh it and I just missed it? Right. It's either you're in or you're out. You're either for God or you're against God. You either love Jesus or you don't love Jesus. Heavenly Father, I pray this message has really touched every person's heart. I pray that people will have enough nerve to share it, not to glorify our channel, to glorify you. Let people be bold enough and convict their heart. And if, they, if they're afraid to post it, ask why wouldn't they post something like that? And, and don't just let it... Even with when I talked about the rapture, how, what evangelist Tiff teaches on, even if you don't have that theology with that, about the rapture, whether you believe that's the next major event or it isn't, which, I mean, it, it obviously is, but don't not post it because you don't agree with a certain theological statement that I said. And be careful when you're watching people teach. I used to do this, and I'm going to share it again. When I used to watch other speakers or go to church many years ago and I would hear a pastor say something <clears throat> or a guest speaker I would it's, it, it's prideful and it's really stupid and I would like to myself correct it oh that's not really that's not right that, that's not good theology that's not sound theology on that then I don't really know what they're talking about listen to people give people time to grow not everybody is going to agree with everything that you're saying. But you have to have the foundation that you only get in through the blood of Jesus. I think everyone is going to agree with that. As a Christian, we can all agree with that. If we have a different uh, you know, theology on end times, eschatology, and you, it could be completely off, your eschatology doesn't get you into heaven either. And your knowledge about end times doesn't get you into heaven either. It's through the blood, one way. Right. Recognizing your sin, repenting of sin, and receiving Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I've learned that from Evangelist Tiff. It went to my spirit. I'm going to keep saying that. He says it's as easy as A, B, C. Admit you have sinned. Believe in Jesus. Put your full trust and faith in him and him alone, not your good works. And C, confess them and make a solid, real commitment to turn your back on sin and turn your heart to Jesus. I heard an acronym last year, CHRIST. Coming home really isn't so tough. God is calling each and every one of his children back home today. Don't wait another moment. So pray this prayer. Heavenly Father, I recognize that I have sinned. I repent of my sin. I turn my back on sin. And I turn my heart to Jesus. I confess with my mouth that Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. I believe in my heart that you raised Jesus from the dead. Come into my heart. I make you my Lord and my Savior. Holy Spirit, come and fill me with your power. Fill me with the fruit of the Spirit. Fill me with the power of your Spirit. Give me power to live holy, live righteous. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for the price that you paid for me. I receive your love today and i will never be the same again in jesus name 
Amen. Amen. We love you guys. I'm asking you to comment on this teaching. I'm asking you to like it. I am putting a challenge out to put, post it on your Facebook page. So if you've seen it and you didn't post it, I might give you a call or shoot you a text and ask you why you didn't. I'll do it, Gina. Oh, I know you will. <laughs> post it, share it. Let's get this message out. And most importantly, like I said, not to glorify Gina and myself, to give people a proper understanding that people saying that God is in control, it's a lot deeper than that. That is not a true statement and it breaks, it gets people confused and it breaks a lot of people's hearts. Because if he's in control, then he somehow allows and if he allows, then he's somehow responsible. We love you guys. We'll see you soon. It is so hot in here. It is fire. Fire. We pray healing over everybody watching. Anybody dealing with a sickness, we speak life into your body right now. Anybody that needs encouragement, encouragement flowing to your spirit right now. Be encouraged in Jesus' name. Anyone that feels like their fire is burnt out, be on fire for the Lord. Go out and love people. Tell them Jesus loves them. Be part of the solution and not part of the problem. We'll see you soon.